So today we're starting a new sermon series. It's five weeks on parenting. It's parenting through Proverbs from Solomon to Dr. Seuss. And I had a whole script written out at the beginning that rhymed like Dr. Seuss books do. And it went about two minutes long. And after I practiced and went through it a couple times, I realized I was getting annoyed. You wouldn't enjoy it. So we're not going to do that today. But what we are going to do for the next several weeks is we're going to look at parenting through the eyes of Scripture, and we're going to use Dr. Seuss as, well, because Dr. Seuss is fun. Dr. Seuss makes you laugh. And in the summer, you need things that make you smile inside. And so we're going to have some Dr. Seuss, and sometimes we'll agree with Dr. Seuss's wisdom, and sometimes we'll contrast with Dr. Seuss's wisdom. And this is one of the weeks we'll contrast a little bit. But as we go through the next several weeks, we're going to look at different ways we parent or how our parenting changes as children grow up. And there's lots of ways you can divide up age ranges and different developmental stages. And we're going to use some very broad categories. So we're going to talk about the discipline years, those toddler years when you have to learn and your kids need to learn how to live within boundaries. Then we'll talk about the elementary years. How do we train our kids? How do we help them develop basic skills in life to become, start becoming competent adults? And how do we train them? Then we'll talk about the teen years. How do you transition from a telling relationship to a coaching relationship so your teens can learn how to make good, wise decisions? Since eventually you won't be there to tell them what to do, they'll have to make them on their own. How do you help in that transition? How do you coach them well through that? And then we'll talk about those young adult years. How do you become a wise counselor friend in your child's life? So I'll, I'll, let me admit up front, the first two weeks of this after today, I feel pretty okay. But by those teen years, I will have had a teenager for precisely six months. I don't know what I'm talking about. And so maybe some of you with teens already out of the house will say they, you don't know what you're talking about. We'll all be in it together figuring some of that stuff out. Um, and we'll just talk about what is, thankfully, it's not really what I'm talking about, is it? It's what does Scripture say? How do we apply Scripture in those different situations? So today, we're going to look at Proverbs 3. But before we do that, I want to give us just a reminder of one of my favorite Dr. Seuss books. Oh, the places you'll go. Well, let's not play it quite yet. Give me a minute. I got a long intro. I mean, I'm a pastor. We talk forever. So... So it's one of my favorite. It's one of the last books. I think it might be the last book that Dr. Seuss wrote. It's a favorite for graduation gifts. And so I'll try not to ruin it for graduation gifts like we ruined that wonderful quote from Jeremiah a few weeks ago about how God has plans to prosper you, not to harm you. We put it in context. We won't do that, but we are going to listen to it. Some of you may not know this book or may not remember it. So each week we're going to give a Reader's Digest version of the Dr. Seuss book for the week read by one of our Camp Zion or one of our Week of Hope students. So sometimes they got excited and they read a little fast, which you're used to because I'm your pastor. <laughs> Usually they read nice and slow. So this week it's a little fast, but it's wonderful. Oh, the places you'll go. Oh, the places you'll go. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You can feed feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know and you are the guy who will decide where to go. Oh, the places you'll go, you'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high, high flyers who soar to high heights. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best wherever you go. You will top all the rest except when you don't because sometimes you won't, I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true that bangs up and hangs up can happen to you. Oh, and on and on you will hike, and I know you'll hike far and face up to your problems, whatever they are. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know, you'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with great care and great tact, and remember that's life's a great balancing act. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and 1 fourth percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains, so be your name Bucks Bomb, or Big Boy, or Bray, or Mordecai, Ellie Vane, Ellen O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says this. Start your children off on the way they should go, 
And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. When we start off as parents, it's important to have a goal in mind. Where, how are we trying to shape our kids? What's, what's the end result supposed to be? Where are we trying to send them? Because however we start them off, we are starting, we're in some sense setting their destiny. We're shaping who they're going to be even as adults, where they'll end up. And I love all the places you'll go. It's a great book. But as I re read the book, I'm struck by how over and over again, the book is about all the things the child's going to accomplish. It's about their achievements, their, 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 their conquering of things. Now, there's an acknowledgement that there are setbacks and struggles, but soon the theme of success comes back. 98 and a quarter percent guaranteed that you will succeed. I hear this emphasis in my own voice when I'm talking with my kids. I hear it in some of my friends' voices, too, when they talk with their kids. We can get focused on whether or not they made the team, how they did in the competition, what kind of grades they're getting. We try to minimize this when our kids are little, and so in some sporting events, they just give them participation trophies. It's interesting to me, though, that our kids have picked up already at four or five that it matters whether or not you win because all of my kids kept scoring t-ball. And when they get participation trophies, they say things like, but everyone got one. It doesn't mean anything if everyone got it. It doesn't mean you accomplished anything. There's a little competitive streak in our kids and maybe in us too, and maybe that's where they got it from. <laughs> Many of our kids feel a lot of pressure to perform, to find their identity and their achievements in their successes, and if we're honest, maybe it's not just our kids, maybe it's their parents too, who find a lot of pressure to perform, to find our identity and our achievement and in our successes. As parents, we can dream of all the great places they'll go and the great goals that they will achieve. But as parents, what should our goals be for our kids? What values and priority should they be picking up from us? What will the initial direction we point them in be in their lives? so that when they're old, they won't turn from it. For that wisdom, we're going to turn today to Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 12. Proverbs is this great book of wisdom right in the middle of your Bible. Um, it's written by Solomon, or much of it is written by Solomon. He's the son of King David. He starts out really wise as king, and then he goes downhill as he gets older. He wanders from God. Other parts of the book are written by other wise people. The beauty of Proverbs, most of the time, is there is no context. They're random little short, pithy, wise sayings, and there's no context to put them in order and figure out how, what they mean in broader context. It's just two sentences. Think about it, figure out how to apply it in your life, and that's kind of Proverbs. Except our text today is one solid, like, 12 verses or so. Hear the word of our Lord for us from Solomon to his son. Solomon says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years, and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father the son he delights in. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect on your word together today, we ask that you would speak, for we long to hear from you, our holy and living God, and our truly good and perfect Father. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. So Proverbs 3 is this dad giving advice to his son. Each, so each short section begins with a command and then a promise of what will happen if you live according to that advice. And today we're simply going to look at these commands as they, 
as they follow one another and see what pattern or counsel we might find along the way. So the first thing this dad does is he tells his son, listen to my teaching, follow my commands. I just want to make a quick observation. You can't teach your kids, you can't have them, a set of commands for them to follow if you don't spend time with them, if you're not connected and engaged in their lives. You need focused time with your kids. I was um, on vacation with our family this week out near Grand Haven, and I went on a wagon ride with Eliana on Thursday night. And we sang camp songs all the way around the little campground. It was so much fun. But as we were going around, I noticed this other dad. We were in the front, scrunched together. I was worried my feet were going to fall off because I couldn't feel them at the end because I had my knees scrunched up so far. I'm too old for wagon rides, is what I realized. But the whole time we're on this wagon ride, there's a dad across from me doing this. It's like a 15-minute wagon ride. He was like this. I watched as we sang how we're in the Lord's army. I watched. He did not sing, and he did not look up from his phone. He did text somebody else. His daughter was grabbing him, wanting him to sing along, and he never once looked up from his phone. You cannot be with your kids if you're not actually present with them. Even if you're physically in the room with them, if this is you... You're not with them. I think we can all commit today that our kids deserve better than this from their parents. Honestly, everyone in your life deserves better than this from you. If this is you, and by the way, as, as I thought about this, I realized this is me when I get home at night and I'm tired. Well, usually I have bad eyesight, I'm old. This is me because I have bigger text then. And I have to be intentional, because if I'm not, I'll spend all night reading articles on politics or on the Detroit Pistons, because I'm obsessed, and it's free agencies, and I'm really obsessed. Who knows why they stink? But I am. That could be me, right? Unless I'm intentional. So in our family, we try to be intentional, because we know that they need time. And it's not just that they need time. There's that debate, you know, do they need quality time or quantity time? Can I just make an observation? Kids need both. They need quality and quantity in part because quantity time does not come out of the ether magically. It comes out of quality time or quantity time. So in our family, we have some habits. We have, we have a dinner together every single night, which means sometimes when I have night meetings, my, my poor kids eat supper at 4.30. And then other times when I get home late, we eat supper at 6.30 because we eat together every single night or when Ethan has stuff late. He's the only kid of our kid who has after school stuff, so he makes us eat late sometimes too. We have late supper, but we eat together. And, and I'd like to tell you, these are wonderful meals. Like we sit down and we talk about deep philosophical issues and we sit in our mutual admiration and affection for one another. But we're actual people. And so, like, we fight to get everyone to sit still for 10 whole minutes. And then, sometimes in those ten whole minutes, someone will start singing a made-up song, and we invoke the no singing songs at the table rule. And then, two people will bicker the entire meal. The kids are like, Mom and Dad, stop. Oh, like you've never bickered in front of your kids. It took you a minute, didn't it? You were like, wait a minute, I think you just said they bicker. But we do it every week, every day. We meet together, and we share a meal, and then... At our best, what we try to do is we ask, what was your highlight? What was your low light of every day? And everyone goes around and talks about their day. And kids love telling us about their day. They get to be the center for a little bit. And we, we listen to one another. And then at night, our, with our younger kids, we, have, we, have, we read Bible stories. We sit on their bed and we read Bible stories. And sometimes we read multiple Bible stories. And, and then we talk about it with them. And we pray with them. And with our older kids, they do devotions. And then, well... I asked them questions to see if they understood whatever they read right, because I like to do that. And so we have to talk about, well, what happens in Matthew 4? How do you understand the baptism of Jesus? And what do you think that might mean for you? My poor kids. You feel for them right now, don't you? And then on Sunday nights, when I remember, Ethan and Noah and I, we study the, study the Heidelberg Catechism together. And they have to memorize it, and we talk about it together. They're so lucky. They're the best kids. But this is the thing. Most of the time when we do that, nothing happens. Like there's nothing magical about it and it's not that exciting and no big thing happens. But all of my kids made their first decision to follow Jesus sitting on their bed reading Bible stories at night with either Rachel or I. Every last one. Because it matters. 
We talk about, sometimes we talk about big things like something that's going on at school or something they're, they're afraid about or something that, that, that's kind of scary coming up for them. Or we'll talk about a hot social issue. Or just this past week, I talked with Caleb about what college he, want, he, thinks, he thinks I think he should go to. So I clarified, I don't care as long as it's not hope. <laughs> I don't care. Sorry, hope grads, but we have standards. <sighs> That was brutal, wasn't it? Oh, I've heard some of you say you won't pay for your kid to go to Calvin. It's okay. So we talked about it. I actually told him it's okay if he goes to Hope, too, as long as he lives out home. <laughs> there are standards here. So we talk about those things. But you don't get quality time without regular patterns of quantity time. And so we make those patterns in our family. If you wonder if it matters, if you wonder if those times together in, 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 in your relationship with your kid matters when they're teens. Th- this is, I found this quote from Christian Smith. He writes about teenage spirituality. He's, he's a social scientist researcher. In his book, Soul Searching, he says this. This is a quote. Most teenagers and their parents may not realize it, but a lot of research in the sociology of religion suggests that the most important social influence in shaping young people's religious lives and then their moral lives and, how, and their overall direction, is the religious life modeled and taught to them by their parents. Sometimes as parents, we can think, oh, my kid's a teenager, they only care what their friends think. All of the research says you still matter more than their friends, even when they think only their friends matter. And they'll tell you only their friends matter. It's not true. You matter more. You have more influence yet when they're teens than anybody else does, even all of their friends combined. Don't waste that. Give them quality and quantity time together. The example you set, how you live your life, will have a huge impact on your children and the values they have when they become adults. Give them that quality time. But in those quality moments, in those moments when we have those, like, just important conversations when we're pouring into our kids. What should we be trying to do? What's the goal? If we read the book, All the Places You'll Go, it's about them succeeding. How do we help them succeed and become become successful and, and accomplish things in their lives? But notice what Solomon focuses on in Proverbs 3. He doesn't focus on his son's talents or abilities. He fo- doesn't focus on what his son will do. He focuses on who his son will be, the character of his son. We'll just walk through him quick a minute. First, he tells his son to bind love and faithfulness on his heart. Or the Hebrew is to bind hesed and emet on his heart, which means nothing to any of us here. But hesed hesed and emet both mean faithfulness, but hesed means that kindness, that, that gentleness toward other people, to the people that you're in relationship with. Emmet is this idea of faithfulness that your word is your bond. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. That if you say that you're going to be there for someone, you're there for them. It's as good as done when you say it. They can trust and rely on you. He says to his son, be someone who is kind to those you love and someone they know they can always rely on. And then you will have a good name and you will experience prosperity in your life. But notice the goal is not the good name. The goal is not prosperity. The goal is love and faithfulness. And then there will be this promised result at the end. It's about his character. Second, he says says to his son, submit to the authority of God in your life. Trust God and he'll make your paths straight. Trust God's word. Obey his word even when it doesn't make sense to you. Submission. This is not a popular word in American culture. We like to be free, independent people, but the Bible says over and over, we need to submit to God. Do you, do you teach your kids how to submit to God and obey God even when it's hard, even when you don't want to, even when it requires sacrifice? Do they see you do it? Do we help them learn how to submit? Third, don't be wise in your own eyes. He says, don't think too highly of yourself, but think about, the, about God. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't think you're all of that. Instead, be in awe of God. Seek God's honor and God's glory rather than your own. Live humbly. Fourth, he says, recognize where what you have comes from. Be generous to God. Give him the first fruits. For a little context of what that would be like, if you're a tither, most of us give God 10% off of our check, right? So if you're going to give the first fruits, Remember, in an agricultural society, you just bring the crop in, 
and they have multiple crops. So it's the first crop you get, you give back to God. So it'd be like in your year, if you get paid every week, the first five checks you give to God, and then you trust he'll pay you the rest of the year to eat. That's what they're saying. Know that everything comes from God. Trust and be generous back toward God. And by extension, then be generous with what God's given you toward others. If it's not yours, it's God's. You can give it freely to other people who are in need. Be generous. And then finally, he says, don't despise God's discipline. Have a teachable spirit. Have you ever met someone who has a teachable spirit? Someone who's willing to admit when they messed up and then ask for help? Someone who is quick to seek advice? Someone who's unashamed to admit mistakes and their need to grow and learn? If you're an employer and you're hiring someone right out of school, isn't that the kind of person you want to hire? Because no college graduate or high school graduate knows anything yet. As someone who graduated from a lot of schools, I knew nothing to any of them when I was done. It's just true. You need to learn. Compare that to someone without a teachable spirit. They never ask for help. They won't admit they don't know what they're doing. When they mess up, they blame other people or deny that it was a mistake. And they always know the right way to do things so they can fix your business the first day on the job. Don't you love those employees? Don't you want that person on your team? Don't you want to have that person in your house that always knows more than you? How do we help our kids develop a teachable spirit? Not simply by others, but especially to be teachable by God. To be willing to submit to God's discipline and grow from it, recognizing that people only teach someone they care about. They only discipline someone that they care about and want to grow and improve. Do they recognize that? Have they seen that in you? That's his advice for his son. Be teachable. Be generous. Don't think too highly of yourself. Obey God. Be faithful. Do you notice a pattern in those five pieces of advice? Not one of them tells his son to accomplish anything. Not one of them is about getting a good job. Not one of them is about getting married. Not one of them is about buying a certain kind of house or earning a certain income or getting a certain degree or getting on a sports team or getting an honors class or getting good grades or anything. It's all about the character he wants to see developed in his son's life. With good character, hopefully you get good outcomes. But the father's job is to focus on the input. What kind of character is he developing? And then to trust God with the outcome, with what kind of life they're going to lead. A couple weekends ago, my my youngest sister got married, and I was sitting at my parents' house at something. We were at my folks' house like five days in a row. At one of those times, I was sitting on, on, on the deck at my parents' house with my two birth sisters and all of our spouses. And I was looking around as we were talking about life, and I realized that between the six of us, we have nine college and graduate degrees between us, and not one of us is in a, in, a, in a career related to what we studied in college. Not one of us. As parents, we can put so much energy, make sure a kid gets the right, into the right school and studies the right thing and gets the right kind of career. For my parents, that totally bombed. So I was thinking about that, and I was kind of meditating on what my parents were like as I was going through my 20s. So I went to college. I was telling Caleb this because we were talking about college and what what college should go to, that I was going to be an astronaut. I was actually genuinely going to be one. I was, I went to space camp all sorts of times. I was in, like, there were articles written about me in the Holland Sentinel, which is big league. Front page about me going to space camp. And then when I was in high school, I was recruited into a study for, for like high achieving science students by NASA to study them and see why they don't stay in science me. And so I did that, and I went to the Jet Propulsion Laboratories. If Big Bang Theory were re- at a real school, that's where they would all work. So I went there for like a week and was in this study with them, and that was on the front page of the lifestyle section of the Grand Rapids Press, above the fold. And I say I was going to be an astronaut. I meant everyone in town knew that's what I wanted to be. So I went and became a math and physics double major. And then I realized something. I don't want to be that. So I became a psychology major. By the way, if you want a degree that cannot get you a job with an undergraduate degree, that's the one. So I got a psychology degree. What do you do with that? Who knows? So I got a job, sort of, 
Never really got a job. I had an internship, and I just never stopped showing up after graduating college. And so they kept me. And then I went back to to school. I got a master's in business in um, organizational design and development. I don't know what you do with that degree either. (laughs) But I got it. And then I worked for a consulting firm in Chicago for all of six months before I told my parents, I think I should go into ministry. I'm quitting my job. At this point, I'm 25. I'm 40-some thousand dollars in debt. have never held a job for more than 12 months. Isn't that great? This is what amazes me about my parents. So, and my parents are not perfect. They're probably going to watch this tomorrow. Hi. (laughs) You're not perfect, but you're pretty great parents. But this is what amazed me about my parents and all of that. You could imagine if my parents were focused on me actually having a career, they had a lot of anxiety of me never ending up in the poorhouse. They had a lot of anxiety. When I told them I was quitting my decent paying job to go be a pastor, and go further into debt and be unemployed basically for three more years, we were at Russ's on 8th Street in Holland. And my dad said, that's interesting. When you need help, and you probably will, you know who to call. But it's fascinating, through all of my 20s, never once did my parents have a conversation with me about what job I would have or what career I would have or how I had to get my life in order. They did have lots of conversations about what kind of friend I was being, how faithful I was in the work that I was doing and on my character. One of the most powerful moments for me in my, in my young adulthood, I was working at Herman Miller and Herman Miller was going through a round of layoffs. My dad worked at Herman Miller at the time too. So I was living in the basement because my parents didn't want me to move out. So they put me in the basement sleeping next to the kitty litter. They were great parents, but it was next to the kitty litter. There was a wall between us, but it doesn't matter. It was next to the kitty litter. But we were both leaving for work, and we drove separately for some reason. We both worked at the same place. So as we're leaving, he pulled me aside, and he said roughly this. I I won't quote him exactly. He said, if you hear something about me losing my job today, because he thought he would probably lose his job that day, because they were going through a round of layoffs, he said, Hold your head high, don't engage in any of the gossip, and give the company the best day of work you possibly can. Because that's who, you're, that's who you were raised to be. Even then, when he was worried about his own job, when in his relationship with me, his concern is what kind of character would I have? That's the concern Solomon has for his son. What kind of character does he have? In our parenting, are we worried about their accomplishments or their character. Because here's the good news for us today as parents who can worry about our kids going to be okay and are they going to make it and all those kind of anxieties we all have. Here's the good news. You're not in charge of your child's destiny because your child ultimately isn't yours. We baptized Michael and Olivia today and we baptized them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you'll notice we didn't use their last names. We never used their last names. Because when you're baptized, you become God's kid. The one in charge of their destiny is God. God has plans to prosper and not to harm. God has plans to make their way straight. God has plans for your child. I don't know what it's going to be. You don't know what it's going to be. My parents did not know I would be a pastor someday, and they did not know how become having a psychology degree uh, focused on counseling and a degree focused on how do you lead organizations through change would ever matter in my life, but it sure came in handy because God had a plan before I did. God has a plan for your kid before you do. God already knows, and we can trust that God's ways are higher and wider and deeper and broader than ours. They're beyond our ability to understand that the God who loves your kid and died for your kid cares more about their future even than you do. And God won't leave them. Our job as parents is to focus on character, but also to focus on helping our kids connect with God. Because when they start making those steps to connect with God, when they begin following His ways, you watch out and you'll see all the places they'll go. Believe this gospel and live in its peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for the gift of children, whether they be little or big. And we ask today that we, your children, 
might more and more develop the character of your son, that we might be people who seek to follow in his way, who seek to live as he did, that we might model for our kids and the kids of this church what it means to be a person, to be a people, deeply in love with the God who loves us, and that in us they might begin to learn how to follow your son. We pray this in his name. Amen.